pleasure to be able to rise tonight and speak to Bill C-54. Canadians expect that their justice system will keep them safe from high-risk individuals, and that's why our government has introduced Bill C-54, the Not Criminally Responsible Reform Act. It is paramount that victims' rights and public safety are balanced off with the decisions taken for high-risk patients who are accused of being not criminally responsible for their actions. Our government's intention is to strike a better balance between the need to protect society against those who pose a significant threat to the public and the need to tra treat the mentally disordered accused appropriately. Our government has always put the victims first, and we always will. Mr. Speaker, the timing of this debate, um, unfortunately, is late. Just last week in Manitoba, the Manitoba Criminal Code Review Board made a decision that I was extremely disappointed in in granting increased community access for Mr. Vince Lee. Now, as most of us remember, Vince Lee was on a Greyhound bus in Manitoba, just outside of Portugal Prairie on July 30th, 2008, when all of a sudden he started stabbing a young carnival worker by the name of Tim McLean. As the bus stopped and horrified passengers fled, Mr. Lee went on to cut up Mr. McLean's body and ate parts of it. Vince Lee was has told a mental health advocate that he heard voices, including the voice of God, telling him that Mr. McLean was an alien who he needed to destroy. Vince Lee was not found criminally responsible and was sent to the Selkirk Mental Health Center in my riding. Now, it was incredibly disappointing to see the decision reached because that decision did not put the victim's rights first, it definitely did not put public safety first, and I'm going to speak to that in more detail. As everyone knows from tonight's speeches that the Not Criminally Responsible Reform Act, which we introduced on February 8th, does three main things. First of all, it's going to enhance victims' rights, and that includes enhancing the safety of the victims by ensuring that they are specifically considered when decisions are being made about accused persons found not criminally responsible. I can tell you that Carol D. DeLay, who is the mother of Tim McLean, said in the Winnipeg Free Press on Monday that, uh, I don't feel particularly safe or comfortable with Vince Lee having these outings. I have made the assumption before all this happened that we all have basic human rights. So how come Timothy's aren't be considered here and only Vince Lee's are? And a quote by Carol. She is concerned that now that he has free and open access in, on, on the grounds at the Selkirk Mental uh, Health Center, as well as escorted leave into Selkirk, Winnipeg, Lockport, and the surrounding beautiful beaches on the south basin of Lake Winnipeg, that uh, she feels that she may come into contact with him because she doesn't know where he's going. And that's why it's important that there needs to be non-communications ordered between an NCR accused and the victim, as well as notifying victims when, the, and are, when they're not criminally responsible, like Mr. Lee, uh, is discharged so that they can come and make plans as to where they're going to be in the community that day and avoid the happenstance of running into the individual who has harmed their loved one. So it is important that we put victims' rights first because in this decision that was just made in Winnipeg uh, by the Man Manitoba um, Criminal Code Review Board did not at all consider the victims' rights, the family of Tim McLean, both Tim's sister and mother read victim impact statements at that trial, and again, their considerations were thrown by the wayside. The second thing that this bill does is puts public safety first. And it, Bill C-54 explicitly sets out that the public safety is the paramount consideration in the decision-making process relating to accused persons found not to be not criminally responsible. This weekend at home, I heard from constituents across the riding, but especially in the city of Selkirk, about how concerned they are that Mr. Lee has free and open access to the grounds of the Selkirk Mental Health Center, uh, beautiful grounds, unfenced, 
Right across the street is a new public library that's going up. Just down the street, Walmart, Canadian Tire, uh, Home Hardware. There, there's all sorts of activity happening around the mental health center. And he has the ability to roam those grounds and, without being monitored, easily walk off the grounds. And so the public are extremely concerned. And I can also tell you, it is not at all comforting to people in the public to run into Mr. Vince Lee when he is being escorted in the community. Because even though that he will have a health care worker with him, as well as a security guard, it is still very disconcerting to be seeing Mr. Lee walk past the front of their home or uh, be in a shopping mall and bump into him. Even though you know, he has escorted Lee, I can tell you whenever I run across a murderer that is under the control and oversight of a security officer, I don't feel any more safe knowing that that security guard is there. In fact, it is more troubling to see that level of security required for an individual to be constrained while they're out in public. The third thing that Bill C-54 does is it creates a higher risk designation. It creates a new designation to protect the public from the high risk, not criminally responsible accused. Upon being designated by a court as a high risk offender, that person is, must be held in custody and cannot be considered for release by a review board until their designation is revoked by a court. There needs to be that higher judicial oversight that doesn't exist today with the review board process. And it still allows access to treatment for any not criminally responsible accused person. So that would not affect it and it uh, is also still in these proposed reforms. I ha heard earlier and you know, the concern that, uh, that this isn't warranted by the member from Halifax. And I, I can tell you that in my community, they want to see this bill go through as quickly as possible. In Mr. Lee's case, it's already too late. Um, but we have a mental health center as one of the uh, um, main health centers in Manitoba is located in, uh, in Selkirk. And they're concerned about who else may end up getting housed there that are going to be found not criminally responsible. I also heard from the member from Sandwich Gulf, uh, Sandwich Gulf Islands earlier, Mr. Speaker, that uh, she goes, this is completely unwarranted. There's no need for it. I don't think we need to look at all the cases of why we need it, but I do want to draw to everyone's attention the situation of Andre Denny. Andre Denny was detained in Halifax at a secure hospital in early 2012 after a court ruled he was not criminally responsible for a charge of assault causing bodily harm. Under the stack, he would be considered a high-risk offender. While he was diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was a teenager, and records show that he was agitated and argumentative and paranoid in the hospital after the court debt verdict. So Denny was a problem patient. They adjusted his medication and his condition improved, and he was granted supervised outings in early February 2012, so just over a year ago. So what happened? Well, several weeks later, on a one-hour pass, he failed to return to the hospital. And he is now charged with second-degree murder of the beating death of an activist, Raymond Tavell, who was killed after he tried to break up a fight between two men outside a bar. So I don't think we need to argue about the need. I don't think we need to talk about the conditions of individuals. We know, and I know in my life, uh, people that I, I have in my, my life that are uh, struggling with mood disorders, personality disorders, that medication doesn't always work. And sometimes medication can amplify the problem or create other violent tendencies. And because of that, Mr. Speaker, we have to err on the side of public safety. We have to consider the rights of the victims' families and the victims themselves so they don't have to endure the long, drawn-out hardship of having these people in their communities and knowing that their loved ones normally uh, are never coming back because of a very violent act by those individuals who uh, have definitely been found in the courts to have uh, some form of mental health issue, but at the same time, uh, a very horrific and heinous crime was caused 
and they feel that there needs to be some justification uh, for that individual to undergo the proper treatment under close supervision, putting victims' rights and public safety first. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Oshlaga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to put this question to my colleague. Why is it that most of the time Conservative bills are punitive rather than preventative? If one really wants to emphasize victims, why not support bills like this with financial assistance for victims, for example? Selkirk Iterlay. Well, I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, and I can tell the member across the way that uh, victims aren't looking for financial help. They aren't looking necessarily for increased punishment. What they're looking for is that their rights are respected, that they are put forth first and foremost in these decisions, and that the memories of their loved ones aren't being insulted like we just saw in Manitoba. So we want to ensure that we do find the balance, but we have to also look at the overall aspect that we aren't always putting as a paramount decision through the review board process, the paramount decision of victims' rights and public safety first and foremost. And if you talk to those who are impacted, yeah, they've had to go on long-term disability because of their own mental health after they <coughs> lose a loved one. And our government has introduced a number of reforms to EI to help uh, with that fact. But more importantly, they aren't looking for, for those types of supports as much as they're looking for to ensure that the public's safety is put first and their loved one's memory is honored. You're here. Uh, questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Vagerville, Wainwright. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, first of all, I want to say I really appreciate my colleague's presentation, but I was kind of uh, shocked when I heard the member from Halifax ask a question earlier. Her question was, you know, why is this needed? And yet we had the member in his presentation talk about Mr. Denny, who in fact is a perfect example, and that's right from the member's home riding of Halifax a perfect example of exactly why this legislation is needed. And I wonder why that member can stand up and ask that question about why this is needed when her constituent of hers has killed again, has killed again, uh, and would be protected probably from a law like this. So I'd like to ask the, the member why the, the disconnect, uh, you know, if he wants to take a guess, uh, in her reasoning on this whole issue. The Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake. I want to thank the, uh, my colleague for that question, Mr. Speaker. And I can tell you that, that um, I don't think anyone that was a friend uh, of Raymond Tavell or anyone that, uh, that, that knew him. Yeah, I, I understand that. And, and so I'm, I'm just saying that, that you can't return that life. And if this bill was in place, it is very unlikely that Andre Denny could have done that heinous crime and that horrific second-degree murder uh, of, uh, of Mr. Tadell and all the good that he is doing uh, in the gay community in Halifax. Uh, his family, his friends uh, were devastated uh, I, and I think we all <laughs> saw the media coverage of that. Uh, I know that all of us, it, it's always concerns us when, when somebody that is dealing with a mental health, health issue uh, becomes this violent. But for those individuals, like Mr. Denny, we have to take the measures possible to confine them and protect the public so that these types of crimes don't happen. We have uh, time for one short question and response. The Honourable Member for Kings Hans. Mr. Mr. Speaker, um, when I hear the dialogue here tonight and I hear Conservative members defending uh, the memory of Raymond Tavell in, in Halifax, and I know that the member from Halifax has raised this issue in, uh, in, in good faith in this House. Number one, um, you can't bring someone back. Um, number two, the Conservatives in this debate continue to demonize and stigmatize people with mental health issues. Not to protect the public, but to pit one group of Canadians against another. And while I would ask the Honourable Member, where is his, his passion to defend the rights of gay and lesbian Canadians? 
And where was it during the debate on same-sex marriage? Now, while I thank him for his interest in these issues tonight, I would ask him to actually consider his long-term perspective and his party's long-term perspective on these issues, and not to use the memory of Raymond Tavell to try to take a position and defend a position that Raymond Tavell would find rep Order. <clears throat> We are out of time. Uh, the Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake, a short response, please. Mr. Speaker, I don't find our debate here at all divisive. This is a commentary about wanting to improve a system. And I appreciate the work that uh, Raymond Tavell did on behalf of the gay community. And I can also tell you that if you want to talk about divisive comments, what about the leader of the Liberal Party earlier this week talking about uh, yeah, yeah. rights of one region of, 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 yeah. of Canada versus the other? Let's pit east That's against clear. west again and again. And this is what we're hearing coming from the Liberal end of this House. Order. <clears throat>